Mr. is Richard Rubin. He's the uh, Wall Street Journal tax reporter. I'm Mark Mazur, the director of the Tax Policy Center. We're going to have a quick little conversation and invite uh, you all to, uh, to participate. So first off, um, Rich, you know, we, uh, we actually grew up not just a few miles apart in, uh, in New Jersey. But you were educated in the Midwest. I was educated in the Midwest, yes, uh, <laughs> at Michigan State. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't. Well, that's okay. Um, but uh, um, when you were, were growing up in New Jersey, you know, at least when I was growing up in New Jersey, most of the people that I grew up with thought they would work in New Jersey, get a job in a factory office around there. But you, know, you went pretty far afield. You ended up uh, working at the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> uh, uh, the Journal does have a large facility in South Brunswick. Okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but you're not we, there. We are, I am not there. Um, well, uh, I was uh, more of a faculty kid than a factory kid. So uh, I, I think that this is not like implausible or out of the mm -hmm. far out of the stretch. Uh, it's not necessarily, I mean, this became an option once. Uh, Center field uh, wasn't an option, and then once second base wasn't an option, um, this was this was a, a good backup plan. And so, how did you wind up uh, with taxes as a beat? That seems like a very specific area to uh, to work in. Yeah, I started covering taxes in two thousand and seven uh, when I came to DC. I uh, was interviewing at Congressional Quarterly, and they had an opening covering defense and one covering taxes, and uh, I was much more comfortable with. Numbers and it's been it's really it's a fun thing to cover. I know why we get a full room of people <laughs> interested in taxes. It's um, you know I like it because it's uh, everybody has an opinion, uh, everybody's affected by it. Um, it intersects with everything, so I get to write about healthcare, about energy, about uh, international relations, about things that are purely domestic in nature. I get to write about states. I get to you know so there's a it it has. Uh, and the other thing that's fun about it is it's, uh, you know, you can write sort of big picture stories. And we saw this in the debate last year. Like, I can, we can write large about fairness um, and equity and all the sort of things that people like to think about, real broad strokes. And then, you know, every layer you go deeper in taxes, there's there's more stories deeper in the details as well. So you can get, you know, the more comfortable you get in particular code sections. There are really interesting stories about how businesses are changing decisions and um, based on how the law changes. And that's, um, so it's that both that depth um, and the, the sort of big picture and, and the politics, right? I can write about politics too. Um, so it's got uh, taxes. Are, got everything. Taxes got everything. Um, you know, it, a, a good motto is, uh, taxes matter, but maybe not as much as you think. So, right. So, going back to the question about like where you know nascent companies might um, want a headquarter, it's like there are lots of non. We all like to think tax people like to think taxes, and there are, there are lots of non-tax things that matter too. So, you've covered the the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act from start to finish, the whole. Assuming months, it's over, yeah, two months or so. Um, <laughs> did you expect that there to be more tax reform? Um, in the bill as it went through, it turned out really it seems like much much heavier on the tax cuts part than on the on the reform part. I, so um, you'll know if you read what what we write. We are I'm studious about not using the word reform. Um, I use overhaul. Yeah, I use overhaul, rewrite, revamp. Um, <laughs> reform just has this sort of positive connotation, but we're among friends, so I'll, so I'll, so I'll use it. Um, and so I think. I think there's actually a lot of reform in there. I, I mean, if you look at what the, you may disagree with the content yeah, yeah. of the reform, but what happened on the, I mean, we all spent like three hours talking about this. Mm -hmm. What happened on the pass-through side is a pretty significant reform of the way we tax businesses. What happened on the international side is a pretty significant reform. The limits on interest deductibility are a pretty significant reform. The limits on the state and local deduction is a pretty significant reform. So. Uh, there's probably 10 others. I mean, the fact that you can't deduct entertainment expenses anymore as a business, like barely written about that, right? So, um, yeah, the balance tilted toward tax cuts and away from tax reform, but there's a, if you only define reform as revenue neutral 86 style, then no. But 
I, I tend to, when I talk about it, I tend to think about it as, were there, are there structural changes in how, in what is taxed and who is paying? And yeah, there's, there's plenty right. of reform there. Yeah, so I guess I, I, I would distinguish between structural change and reform, thinking reform being fairer, simpler, more efficient. And not so much on that side. There are a few, I think, you know, get rid of the uh, charitable deduction for season ticket holders of major college football programs. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be like clearly in the reform side. But the pass-through one, it's arguable, right? That's a big structural change, but probably not simpler, probably not fairer, probably not more efficient. Yeah, see, I think it depends, how, again, how you define it. Like, is fair mm -hmm. is very, is one of those words, like reform is one of those words that, it's it's in the eye of the beholder. It's a political choice, and so we can get sort of caught up in trying to figure out whether a new system is more or less fair. But it's actually a, a, a oh God, I'm not going to say the word normative. No, it's a normative kind <laughs> yeah. of choice. Yeah. yeah. So when you were um, covering the tax cuts in Jobs Act, was there ever a time you thought that it would not turn into law? Um, up until. Like in the middle of September is when my thinking flipped. So I was, uh, you know, I, in my head all throughout covering this, and that goes literally since the day that I started covering taxes, I, I sort of keep in my head like how close are we to tax reform, reform mm -hmm. um, happening. And I don't think I, I got over 50% uh, in like election night at 3 a.m. and then like reality set in and like, okay. Um, and, but I think to me what really, the, what flipped it was the deal that Senators Corker and Toomey struck in mid-September on the budget agreement. Like until then, it was not clear that, um, like the, there was still debate about like, should there, like, were they going to get a budget? Was it going to be a real budget? Was it going to have to balance? And, and that agreement, um, which I think surprised a lot of people when it came out, w was really the said, okay, we're, we've got this trillion and a half, and that was, you could sort of see, it wasn't inevitable at that point, but it became more likely than not, again, tax term, right? <laughs> um, to, for, for people to, to sort of see how you could use that one and a half, how they could use that one and a half trillion to spread around and make enough, create, change that winners to losers ratio. When Before that, if you were thinking about a purely revenue neutral, even revenue neutral on a dynamic basis, um, it's there still would have been a the winners to losers ratio would have been really politically difficult once they had a trillion and a half to play with it you, you could see the path it's always hard with the winners and losers ratio right because the losers are really sure that they're they're going to lose that they think that they are being disadvantaged or a law change and the people who may benefit maybe not so sure and for sure not going to raise their hand publicly and say hey uh, I'm a winner look at me um, and so the politics. Um, make it difficult to do reform, and you you sum this up as uh, tax reform is hard. Yeah, uh. but but again, think about the winners losers, losers ratio and people not think right. So the TBC numbers had in twenty eighteen have eighty percent of households getting tax cuts and five percent um, with tax increases. If you look at the polling, even polling today, and certainly polling when they were voting, people's perceptions of whether they would get tax cuts, not the perception of whether they thought the law was a good idea, which is mm -hmm. a separate question. But perceptions of whether people got tax cuts were not quite the inverse of that, but pretty close to it. So, so that phenomenon was happening, and, but the fact that the actual winners to losers ratio, again, measured purely as tax cuts in the first year or not, was so, was so big that meant that there were still enough people who thought they would get tax cuts to prevent the whole thing from collapsing politically. And Republicans sort of had the confidence to know that um, they thought that those, that as people saw their withholding change, saw their tax bill change, got maybe not the bonuses, but eventually wage increases that the bill would become more, if not popular, then popular enough to not be the, the anchor that it looked like it might have been in uh, November, December. I mean, that's one of the things that at, at uh, Tax Policy Center, we tried to, to make the point that there was a different um, view on winners and losers depending on what time you looked at. Mm -hmm. So if you looked at 2018, we were pretty clear like 80% of the people were getting tax cuts, and I think that's when Senator Hatch was giving us credit for, for helping them. Um, but then we said, you know, in 2027, when these provisions expire, it flips a different way, right? Lots of people have tax increases. And 
I think in the, the, the political world, a lot of people heard that second part and, and didn't really believe the first part so much. Well, and I think that was the final version of the bill. There, that yeah. was not the only exactly. one. So the, you know, the original House version, the revised House version, the first Senate mm-hmm. version. I mean, so I, I think there was probably, I mean, I was bewildered mm-hmm. during that six, seven weeks. I can't imagine people who are trying to follow this and figure out whether their own taxes would go up or down in, in any of the various iterations. So I think that was certainly part of what was likely causing some of the people's estimations to be of their own benefits to be lower. And, and again, I don't know, when people answer that, those kinds of polling questions, are they thinking, how am I going to benefit in 2018? Are they thinking, you know, are, are they influenced by their own political views of the bill, even if they're asked specifically about their own tax bills? And, and then, of course, in the, the 80% figure includes the business taxes mm-hmm. being distributed out to, uh, to workers. So you know, some fraction of that 80% actually, if they look only at their own income tax, will actually end up paying more or not get a tax cut. So what was the most surprising part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act? Um, The speed, to me, with which it went from the first legislative text to done Mm -hmm. uh, was was really the speed. In 2011... Uh, in a previous job, I said to an editor, I said, we should really write a, st-. you know, back when Camp was, Dave, Dave Camp had just taken over and he was talking about various, um, you know, his plans. I said, we should write a story about the importance of transition rules. That there's going to be this big lobbying effort around trying to make sure that transition rules are set up to, you know, businesses are really going to lobby and push for specific things that are helpful to them to smooth out the first couple of years in a, in a new system. And the editor's response is, no, 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 it's too soon, too soon to do that. So I never wrote the story. Um, and so I never actually, I, I meant to write it at some point in November, December. Suffice to say, transition rules are important. Uh, businesses lobbied for them and some of them got them. Um, and it just, like, this, but the speed of the process meant that we just didn't get to write stories like that. And, and so even things like the international system Someone said it earlier that, like, um, or the chairman said it, right? That there hasn't been, you know, enough attention paid to the international international system. Well, that part of that is because they went from the, the period of time between when the Senate version, which actually had the beat and the guilty that was ultimately the bill, came out November 9th, and it was signed into law on the twenty second. So without like a serious hearing to kind no, of go through each of those provisions, right? Now it's I mean, the Republicans will argue correctly that. I, that they've been talking about territorial systems for a long time, right? So, and that's true. There was plenty of discussion about the concept and people talked about minimum taxes. But the actual structure of what they did is actually being debated more now than it was <laughs> in that six to seven week period mm-hmm. when they were writing the legislation. And that's just, there was just too much else to do. There were, I mean, I, you know, we, we did what we could, but there's, you know, five, six different versions important things affecting uh, individuals, pass-throughs, estates. There's all the politics that was going on. There was just, it, it was a, and so what surprised me was the sort of intense flurry of how fast it happened and how, not that it prevented people from looking at it and thinking about it, but the more detailed and technical a provision was, the less attention it necessarily got in that, in that compressed window. Mm-hmm. So in uh, the age of social media, you've been a consistent contributor to Twitter. You've contributed to the live blog at, at Wall Street Journal. What is different um, dealing with social media compared to traditional journalism? Or how, how has traditional journalism changed in the era of social media? Um, I mean, it's great. Like, I, it, you know, like, it, um, so it was a really intense six to seven weeks. But I, like, all the time I'm getting, it's, you get this, instant feedback loop of ideas and thoughts and comments. And so I'd write something and I'd hear back, you know, I, in email, phone call, Twitter, whatever. I mean, I, I, got, I had to get used during this process to texting sources, which I had never done really before, but I did. Um, and so you get, I, I, it actually made the whole thing, it, despite the fact that there was a lot of stuff that we weren't able to get to in that compressed time frame, 
um, the ability to move faster um, and publish faster and think faster, uh, I mean, it helped. I, I get ideas from, from everywhere, um, from experts and non-experts alike. And even branching out the video too. Yeah, no, uh, and so yeah, we um, I, we've been doing uh, tax explainer videos, which people actually watch, mm -hmm. um, and again because people care, and so it, so you know what we're trying to do is reach um, both a sort of tax audience and not and do things that are uh, accurate and helpful for a tax audience, but also that reach out to our broader audience that is interested but not necessarily technical tax people. It feels very strange to be sitting here answering questions instead of asking you questions, by the way. So do you do, do, you do your own taxes? I don't. You don't? No. I, um, do you do your own taxes? I do. I, I no. do TurboTax, but uh, because Commissioner Rosati, uh, when, I, when I worked there, uh, reminded me that my time was more valuable, and so instead of being a scribe and writing the numbers down, I should uh, use the software and file electronically. Uh, no, <laughs> I don't. I, um, I figure that... Hires people are probably watching this. Um, <laughs> that I don't want to do anything to invite extra scrutiny, so having an extra set of eyes on my return is probably a good idea. And so, what do you do in your free time away from taxes? Taxes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, someone else does your taxes. <laughs> oh no! Oh, really? Um, oh, really? No, uh, uh, I read. I like baseball. Oh. Um, I try and get away from taxes every, every so often. Yankees fan, Mets fan, Nationals fan, Nationals yeah, fan. Yeah. Some cheering over there. Um, last question I have, and then we'll turn it up to the audience. Um, are there any journalists that you like, especially admire? Oh, I let me just offer a word of praise for everyone who's covering the tax bill. Last year, it was um, an exhausting and long and tough process for all of us, and there's a lot of really great. Um, and I, I I don't want to name people because I mm -hmm. I worry like worried about leaving people out, mm -hmm. but I, but. But there's a lot of really good coverage. I can't tell you the number of times in that, I mean, all of last year, but especially in that six to seven week period when the bill was live, when I read something, I was like, ah, I meant to, get, I meant to write that. <laughs> I should have thought of that. Like, so all the time, there's lots of really great um, and smart coverage out there. I, I, you know, I didn't read or watch everything, but there was, you know, if, if you were following the bill, um, you were able to get a lot of information. If you were following closely and you knew where to look, you were able to get a lot of really good information. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe open up to the crowd for questions. Oh, you, sir, way in the back. Microphone's coming. Uh, Richard, did you have a sense of who was making decisions, big decisions and small decisions during this fast and opaque process? The usual suspects are tax writing committee uh, chairs, uh, political leaders of the House and Senate, the White House and Treasury. Last weekend, uh, the leading technician uh, from Treasury uh, discounted uh, his input, uh, saying Treasury had very little input. They sat through drafting, but very little input. How were decisions being made? Um, quickly. Um, I think there were so... It, in the House, you had Chairman Brady and his committee staff sort of really owning their part of it uh, with input from uh, leadership staff. Mm -hmm. And on the Senate side, you sort of had you had the chairman and his uh, and his staff, and they and uh, leadership policy staff as well as um, you know they appointed four or five senior finance committee members to. Orchestrate the thing, and the Thune, Toomey, Portman, Scott, and Cornyn, um, who sort of were able to cut a lot of those deals, you know. The, um, and so, largely, that's who was making the decisions. I, I didn't. I mean, Treasury was involved, but I didn't sense a lot of Treasury in like technical input at the time. Um, joint Tax was involved, but they're not. You know, they advise and don't necessarily. Um, uh, make the decisions, but it, this this was it, this was an art of the possible, art of the fifty one votes, and so and yeah, that's it, it was you know it's members. It, there were many things that were member level decisions, but it's you know it's a pretty small group of senior staff that 
uh, guided the process. Ma'am, Emil. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a couple of things that you counted as reform that hadn't gotten a lot of attention. One thing that I've been made aware of, and I may not know have all the details right, but it has to do with the tax deductibility of salaries in excess of a million dollars, um, whether that's deferred income, whether that's stock options uh, coming into fruition or whatever. Um, how do you see that? I've seen nothing written about it. Um, I know at least in one instance um, the impact of it could have a pretty significant um, effect on what the tax rate is for the company itself. Um, and they're not a very high-paying company, so I was sort of amazed at that. It could have larger impact on compensation, how people think about comp, you know, what you do in, as a board member on a comp committee thinking about, you know, how competitive you're being and so on, what kind of salaries you want to pay, how you want to pay them. It seems to me this is something that should be interesting to people, but it hasn't been covered. Uh, we've written on it some, and I'm sure we're going to be writing on it some more. We had a story uh, just last week, I think, on the nonprofit side of this about there's a similar cap that got imposed mm -hmm. on uh, nonprofit compensation over a million dollars, and so we had a piece that looked at nonprofit hospital compensation and uh, the, the way it sort of works differently depending on how unified your entity is. If you're split into a bunch of nonprofits, then each of them might be subject to the to the cap on its five top five employees, as opposed to if you're a unified system. Uh, so I'm sure we'll do more of that. Um, broadly, what it did is you, you presume you know is it there used to be sort of an exception for performance-based, deductible performance-based pay over a million, and now that's um, they've limited that. I'm sure that's one of those areas that um, tax lawyers are trying to find. That's just through DNA to make sure. Yeah. No, no, I'm sure. But now, no. Yeah, and so I, I'm sure that's something we're going to be looking at more. Okay. Question in the middle here in a blue shirt. Oh. Microphone's coming. There you go. Um. So if we're going to have policy making as a tennis match and not a collaborative, and, and you were and you talked to some Democrats during this process, say they come back into to power, if they want if they want to get more revenue for priorities they traditionally favor, to what degree could they walk back the corporate tax change, and to what degree wouldn't they be able to because of this international situation, and then where else could they look? I think that's that is exactly the question. That's that that's a great question because it will shape um, how Democrats view this, in part in going into this year's campaign. But more, what I'd watch for is the presidential candidates for 2020 because it's the most likely time when they'd actually be able to do something. Would be a, if they had unified control of the government in 2021. Um, and I think you'll see a split. There were as um, the chairman said, though he kind of went a little farther than the reality of it, uh, there are Democrats, there are a lot of Democrats who wanted to cut the corporate tax rate. And so it may not be the case that that's the lever that they would want to pull, certainly, and, or even if that's where some of them want to go, there may not be 51 Democratic votes for 25 percent, 28 percent, whatever. Um, so I, I'd pay attention to what the levers might be. You can look at uh, changes on the international structure. Um, you know, dialing those rates. You could, they could look at um, cap gains and dividends on the individual side, the rate structure on the individual side. Um, there, there's a lot of you know, different uh, ways they can go with this, and I, I'm, I'm going to be watching and writing and curious, but uh, about exactly where different factions within the party go. You, you, you'll note that they ha hasn't, there hasn't been a lot of um, we must repeal it right away kind of arguments. I, I think you'll see much more a keep the things they like, and try and uh, pare back the things they don't. You have a natural time, right, at 2025, when the um, individual things expire. You can come back and revisit it at that point, perhaps writ large. Yes, but I think one thing that we've seen the way that policymaking happens is that members know that if they're in that situation when they have control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, they're going to go mm -hmm. um, with 
the, you know, I cannot tell you I, how many times I heard the failure is not an option, perfect can't be the enemy of the good. Like, that was the motto of Republicans in, in the fall of last year. And so, I, you know, they know how short the policy for all the big, you know, there's plenty of people at Brookings who have, like, written books and papers on why the modern Congress is this way. But that's, like, it's ingrained in their minds that if they have control, they're going to pick a top two or three priorities and, and do as much as they can. Okay. okay back, uh, Gene Sterling, back there. Hi, Gene Sterling at Tax Policy Center. Uh, I was thinking of reasons to the other sessions, but it didn't quite fit, so it's probably not a fair question to ask you. But is there any thought to given to the situation of new businesses, startup businesses, relative to established businesses in this, uh, in this uh, tax bill? I know when we worked on the uh, tax reform in the 80s, one of the things we pushed in actually trying to, for instance, establish depreciation allowances was that expensing really disfavored the new business that could ever use the deductions. And I haven't even thought out how this plays out on the international front. So I'm just curious whether that's a topic uh, that you or someone else uh, might have be reporting on. Um, that's a good set of questions. I mean, I guess, right, the full expensing would seem to benefit new capital as opposed to old capital, but as you point out, if you're spending a lot of money up front, you may not be able to get to use all of that right away. So, um, and the NOL limits will play into that somewhat too. Um, I don't know. That's a good, that's a good set of questions about where the incentives are for new business and whether they, you would want to set up, uh, in past reform or corporate form too. Okay. Up here in the middle. Thank you, Gerald Chandler. Uh, off the record, what have people in Congress told you about uh, entitlement <laughs> reform? <laughs> and uh, on the record, do you think anything can be done before the country runs out of money? Um, so I'm not going to share any off-the-record conversations I've had, but I, but I also don't really... And it's one of the limitations that we have is I... Um, uh, I cover taxes and probably, like, mm -hmm. blinder a bit. Um, so... I don't know. I, th I think this is one of those. I, I, I would argue that the bill that passed last week probably makes entitlement reform, and there's that word again, um, less likely because you know you've got Democrats will say, "Wait a minute! Like we just spent a whole bunch of money on that. What? Like why can't we do that over here too?" So I, it to me, it seems any sort of major entitlement bill seems farther off than it was. I don't know what triggering event is for some sort of change of mind on that. Well, thank you very much, Richard. I appreciate you coming here. Um, please join me.